Thank you very much <clears throat> and good evening. Um, so I want to give a talk which I think of as a poem, uh, a love poem to the words what if, I suppose. I want to explore what if, but before I do that, I want to ask you to do something for me, which is if you could find somebody who you could be in a pair with. So have a look around, see who that person might be. Find a person you're going to be in a pair with just for a minute. Everybody got somebody? Sh sh shovel along if you're, if you're on your own and you need to find someone. So I'm going to show you a picture and you, of an object, which is an object that you see most days of your life, and you'll have one minute to think of as many different uses for it as possible. They can be sensible, they can be ridiculous. You don't have to think, is this economically feasible? Anything like that. Just ideas. And keep account of how many ideas you come up with. OK? Everybody happy? Does that make sense? OK. Go. The coffee cup. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to draw you to a halt. So, uh, put your hands up if you've got more than five. Very good. If you've got more than ten. Ah, fifteen. Wow, very good. Does anybody, has anybody got one that they thought, I really hope we get the opportunity to share? That was so brilliant. I really hope we get the opportunity to share that with everybody. No, they were all mundane. Yes. To grab an insect. <laughs> oh, somebody else's was to grab an insect. Very good. Okay. Maybe one more. Yes? To use those shoulder pads as homemade clothing. Very nice. Very good. One more? To drink. To drink. Okay. <laughs> Pushing the boat out there. I did this in Sweden, and one of the a woman in the audience said, I would use it to keep the darkness in, which I still have strange dreams about. Anyway. <laughs> So the reason I wanted to start with that is that I love doing that because when I look around the room, when you're doing that, there is a kind of a spirit of... There's a, there's, there's a, there's a brightness, there's laughter, there's connection, people are connecting to each other, and that's the spirit for me about imagination, which is, what I, which is part of what I'd like to talk about this evening. This is the human brain, and I'm really... At the moment, I'm researching a book about imagination and the, and the role of imagination in the shift that we need to see in that tiny window of time we have to make that shift. And this is a really important part of it. This is the, the hippocampus, part at the middle of the brain where when we're, when we're being imaginative, there are different networks that fire when we're being imaginative, but they all have the hippocampus at its center. And the health of the hippocampus is absolutely essential to us being uh, as imaginative as we can possibly be. And a while ago, I read some research by a woman called Kyung Hee Kim, an American researcher, who uh, had looked at something called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is the gold standard way of measuring creativity imagination. She had this data set that went back to the early 1960s, big, big data set. Her conclusion was that IQ and imagination rose together until 1990, at which point IQ continued rising, and imagination went into what she called a steady and persistent decline. And when this research was published, it was on the front page of Newsweek. There was a whole load of soul searching in America. What does this mean for economic growth? What does this mean for Hollywood? 
But I never heard anybody in the climate change, social justice, community activism world say, well, what does this mean for us? Because fundamentally what we're trying to do is to enable people to imagine a different way that the future could be. And maybe if it's not moving fast enough, rather than just thinking we have to campaign harder and lobby harder, maybe we need to explore that fundamental thing of do we have a challenge in terms of our imagination? Because it pops up in things like this, which is possibly the worst book I ever read in my whole life. My, my withering review of this can be found online if you want cheering up at some point. This kind of idea that actually uh, we can't imagine anything other than fossil fuels because fossil fuels have been really great. It's like saying, well, uh, uh, you know, the, the first three months of this deeply abusive relationship I'm in were really great, so maybe I should stick around in it, you know. This is, this is when we look at the, the relationship with fossil fuels we see coming out from lots of places, for me, that's a real uh, symbolism of when the imagination starts to evaporate. So why might it be? What might be some of the things that could be impacting our imagination at this time when we need to be at our most imaginative. Imagination, one of my favourite definitions of it is that vast and scintillating internal fountain of all things strange and new. And I think one of the reasons why is because of the decline of play in our society. And when I grew up, kids played out in the street all the time. You speak to adults now, 71% of them will tell you as children, they played out in the street. Now about 21% of children play out in the street. Our children are under what Richard Louvre, who wrote The Last Child in the Woods, calls, um, uh, what does he call it, I forgot, uh, uh, well-meaning protective house arrest they start compiling their CV from the age of four. <laughs> and this was in my town where we had a street games festival where we got the kids out in the street learning how to play street games again, learning to play with each other. But when we look at what, what capitalism is providing our children uh, for, f to feed their imagination, I went to the London Toy Fair as part of the research for this book I'm doing, and I was looking for this, which is Hello Barbie. Not that I wanted one for myself, but it was, it was uh, because this is the first of these sort of Wi-Fi enabled smart dolls. In Germany, these are actually classed as illegal espionage apparatus, and parents can be fined for turning the Wi-Fi on in these things. Well, if you could ever design the most perfect way to, 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 to destroy your child's imagination, you give them a doll that speaks to them using a 280-page script developed by Mattel. I think another of the things that is happening is, is, the, is the presence, the overwhelming presence of screens uh, in our life and the impact that that is having on our attention span. There's a brilliant book that just came out very recently by James Williams about attention. He says, the liberation of attention may be the defining moral and political struggle of our time. Its success is a prerequisite for the success of virtually all struggles. And I interviewed a neuroscientist who told me that he said uh, that he thought that our imagination went down in comparison to the amount of time we spent on our smartphones. You know, we have a real issue, I think, in terms of the amount of time we could be spending cultivating our imagination. We spend scrolling through uh, endless feeds. Also, we spend less and less time in nature. Our children spend less and less time in nature. And I think as well, we also are seeing what people call pre-traumatic stress disorder. When we live in a time during my lifetime, 50% of all of the wildlife we share this planet with has disappeared. We've lost 97% of the tigers, 75% of all the insects. And what impact does that have on our imagination when we live in a world where we see diversity dwindling? Does it encourage us to be more creative or do actually, do we, do, do we live in a state where our brains are, are, are in a state of anxiety and stress because of that? So to come back to our hippocampus, the thing with the hippocampus is that it is the part of the brain that is uniquely vulnerable to cortisol. When people uh, have post-traumatic stress, the hippocampus shrinks by about 20%. When children grow up in very traumatic childhoods, their hippocampuses are much smaller. And when your hippocampus is smaller, you get stuck in this sort of uh, inability to really imagine the future. The future shrinks and, and how you look at that. So my question is, how can we bring what if into this to try and tackle this? How can we really kindle the imagination at the community scale, which is what we've been doing for the last 12 years with the transition movement, now active in 50 countries around the world, thousands of communities, a self-organizing movement of people who are trying to bring that question of what if to life where they live. This is a place in London called Tooting. 
There's nothing particularly remarkable about Tooting, uh, but it has a very active, vibrant transition group in the middle of London. They have a long street. They don't have anywhere you would call a village green or a square or a central place where they, people could come together. So the transition group said, what if that bus turning circle was our village green? It's a circle normally full of buses, engines on all day, just sitting there. They said, what if that was our village green? And actually, not just what if, we're going to turn it into that for the day. So they closed the street, they, 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 they had food, they had music, they had flowers, they had drummers from, from the Sikh temple, and they spent the day living as though that had already happened. The beautiful thing about it was that it started to open up more what-if questions. People, for the first time, sitting in their village green, which had grass and everything, um, could, were sitting for the first time and saying, I've never noticed that wall before. What will we paint on there? When this is our village green, what will we paint on there? So by asking the right what-if question, you open up more what-if questions. It becomes something that builds a kind of a momentum of possibility, which is something that we see again and again with these sort of projects locally. And there's something that I love about, about that idea of how do we bring the future into the present. We live at a time when we are surrounded by dystopias, by stories about how awful the future is going to be. Almost every film in the cinema is telling us how awful the future is going to be. Well, where are the stories about actually how completely fantastic the future could be if we get this stuff right? And how do we bring into people's everyday life a taste of that so people can see what that might feel like? This is something I heard about recently in America, which I love, called Parking Day, where what they do is people come out in, in in towns and cities, and they, they, they look at parking spaces as if they, they call them low-rent performance spaces. So what they do is they go and they buy a parking ticket for that space for the day, and then they turn it into something else. So, so, so no cars can park there because they've filled it up with other things, and they've paid for a ticket, so it's fine. They bought the space for the day. They can, they can do what they like. So they might turn it into a, into a sort of a sitting space made with recycled things. They might turn it into a place for people to do yoga, possibly. They could use it for playing bool by the side of the road. They could play Connect Four on the big sort of Connect Four. And I love that idea that actually we find those ways to give people a taste and a feel and a sense of, of, of how it could be. This is uh, uh, some drawings that, that Quentin Blake, who is one of my favorite artists in the whole world, did in a maternity hospital uh, in France, in Angers. And his brief was to, 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 to give women arriving at the maternity hospital a time when they're very anxious and very stressed, uh, a different experience. He calls these the... Um, he says they are a celebration of what's going to happen and a reassurance that it is going to happen. So they're paintings of the first time uh, the mother meets, meets their child. They're beautiful. The first time I saw them, they made me cry. They're absolutely beautiful. Uh, but it's that sense of how do we give people a taste of actually how the future could be in, in the time now. And that's one of the things that we do a lot of in transition. So one of my favorite what-if questions I came across recently was this project happening in London, which said, um, actually, in London, uh, this is a map of London just showing the green spaces and the blue spaces and no buildings. So they said, actually, 47% of London is green space, and 2.5% of London is blue space, park, uh, lakes, rivers. If we could just make one, uh, another half a percent, then the majority of London would actually be green and blue space. So they said, what if London were a national park? They produced this beautiful map uh, that showed that. And just that question, what if London were a national park, which is going to happen next year. London will be designated a national park city. The idea is that every citizen in London, if they took a metre square and turned it green, then that would be enough. So there's a beautiful way of engaging schools, engaging children. And when I spoke to Daniel Raven Ellis, who does this project, I asked him, how do you turn a what-if question into a project like this? And he said that you use tools to awaken people's imaginations. It might be maps or photography or images and being really positive. Get artists, poets, culture makers involved straight off. Get it out of the environmental movement as quickly as possible. It is culture and people that will drive change. 
This is a, a, a project that I went to visit last week, which, which I think is just brilliant. So some of you will have, you'll have seen the, 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 at the beginning, I had a picture of the David Bowie £10 note, one of the most famous local currency uh, notes from Brixton in London. These are the, this is recently the Lake District launched the Lake District Pound as a currency for that whole region. These local currencies are happening all over the place. But this is a project which is slightly different. And this comes back to what I was saying about cortisol, because cortisol in communities shuts down possibility. It shuts down imagination. That cortisol that comes from stress, anxiety, fear. And actually, how can we find, if we want to do transition properly, meaningfully in a place, we want to engage as many people as possible in thinking positively. That's where we want to go. I think one of the things we need to do is identify where are the pockets of cortisol in that place. Where are, what are the things that are driving the cortisol? And one of the things is debt. And that sort of toxic debt uh, that people get into, we see a lot of it in the UK at the moment with the government's austerity agenda, which is pushing lots of people into, into toxic spirals of debt. How, so this project starts with a what if question. What if this community were able to come together and come, have a creative way to try and tackle that problem? So they found an empty bank. They took over an empty bank. And they turned it into the People's Bank. They called it a, a, an act of citizen money creation. They printed these notes. They're not a local currency. You can't spend them. They're like limited edition artworks. And they print them in the bank. They have printers in the bank. Anybody can call, call in any time and see this money being printed in the bank. Absolutely beautiful. Screen printed, block printed, just lovely, lovely works of art. The people on the notes are really interesting. So this is saying, who in this place do we want to recognize as being our heroes? Who are the people who are stepping up and trying to, tr trying to bring the imagination to how, what we do now? These two guys run a project which keeps young people from getting involved in gangs. This guy, Gary, he mortgaged his house in order to set up a local food bank to help local people who couldn't eat. This is the head teacher at the local primary school who lost all of their funding for the arts. And this family here run a kitchen where every day they feed 200 people f free meals twice a day. Uh, and actually, so the idea is that they want to print and sell 50,000 pounds worth of these notes. Half of that money will be divided between these four charities, but the other half, they will go to the secondary debt market and use it to buy back a million pounds worth of debt in that neighborhood and cancel that debt. When I heard about that, I thought it was so smart. Absolutely brilliant. And as a way of trying to bring the kind of, uh, trying to look at how you shift the, the, the cortisol out of the community, I think it's just brilliant. This is in uh, Les Mureaux, which is a suburb of Paris, one of the banlieues, where a while ago there were big riots and it's, and it's sort of, a lot of its reputation is around that. I went there last year where they were starting to do transition and they had a beautiful what if question. They said, what if Les Mureaux was a tourist destination? What if people came to Les Mureaux on holiday? And they've set up all kinds of things to facilitate that, where people can come and have meals with different families and they're growing food. But it's a beautiful what if question that is opening up so much possibility in terms of how they're looking at their future. So the last story that I want to tell you is from Liège, up, up the road. So I went to Liège about four years ago when Liège en transition were quite young. They'd been going for a couple of years and they'd started some different projects. And they had this what if question. What if, in a generation's time, the majority of the food grown, uh, eaten in Liège was grown on the land closest to Liège? So they invited together scientists and academics and chefs and anyone who cared about food at all for a series of events. And I was there for the first one of those. And then I didn't really hear anything uh, for three or four years. So then I came, I came home. And then I went back there about two months ago. And in that time, They've started 14 cooperatives, uh, so a farm, two, two vineyards, a brewery, a delivery business, a mushroom growing business, this shop which is called Les Petits Producteurs, and in the Petits Producteurs they, they, they sell food produced by local farmers. Those 14 cooperatives raised 5 million euros in investment from local people. When I met with uh, this man, Pascal here, he manages the shops. I said, what's the ambition with, with this? He said, well, we started the first shop and within a couple of months, we were way ahead of our best case scenario. So we opened a second shop. We want to open 10 shops. We feel by the time we get to maybe 12 or 13, the supermarkets will start to fragilize. 
which isn't a word that really works in English, but it kind of also really does work really nicely in English. So the supermarkets will start to fragilize. And the beautiful, uh, what I loved about it there was when I was there, I met the mayor, and the mayor of, of Liège said, eight years ago, we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. We own a whole load of land around the city. We're making that land available to young people who want to get into farming. And so you're starting to see this kind of momentum. You know, what we've seen over the last 50 years, that move towards monoculture has been a shutting down of imagination, a shutting down of possibility. What I see again and again when I visit places doing transition with vibrant local food markets and new economies starting to emerge is that when you start to move back in the other direction, all manner of possibilities open up and, and, and all sorts of things become, become possible. And you see that, and this is a city, the city of Preston in the north of England, where the city of Preston uh, was economically really in a hole. And they invited together the, the, the seven key organizations who spend public money, 750 million pounds a year, and they said, what if we did this differently? And where does the money go at the moment? Nobody knew. So they found that only 4% of the money they spend actually goes into the economy of Preston, the rest of it leaves. So they're now changing the whole model, bringing their pension funds back, changing how they do tendering, setting up cooperatives to supply the hospitals with food and energy and laundry and all that kind of thing, based on that model that we want to keep the money here. But again, it comes back to that big, asking the, the, the really bold what if question. So I want to leave you with this. I was in Lyon recently, driving through Lyon. And I saw this out of the window, and I thought it was beautiful. It, look, it looked to me like the dustbin and the bollard are star-crossed lovers, <laughs> completely in love with each other underneath the starry sky. The dustbin, if, if it could purr, I imagine it would be purring like a cat. And, uh, uh, and, and so to me, it was just a little moment that I saw out the window. But actually, all that took was a couple of dots and a line on that bollard. And my experience is that when you work in the community, if you find the right little interventions that you can make that can really open up people's imaginations, people's sense of what's possible, then things really start to move uh, very, very quickly. And having that sort of trust that that will happen so you don't try and control it all, but really giving people the permission to, to, to come up with those questions is a really key part of how we're going to navigate the next 10 or 15 years. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I'll look forward to any questions afterwards. Thank you.